It is flat. Please, have a seat. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you tonight because this is a Gordon Lecture. And uh, this is one of our most prestigious uh, lectures that we give, or that we have. The lecture itself was established by Albert H. Gordon back in 1987. And uh, it's a reflection of Mr. Gordon's interest. Uh, he, we've heard from a remarkable group of people, ranging from Soviet President Gorbachev to U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff. Mr. Gordon himself uh, is a dedicated graduate of the Harvard class of 1923. Um, and he is still very much with us, although he is not with us today. Uh, and so it's, it's really quite remarkable. He was the founder and former chairman of Kidder Peabody and Company. And he's been a very great friend of this university. He's served on the Council on University Resources, a member of the Board of Overseers, uh, and one who's, who is a graduate of, of the business school as well. So uh, all in all, he's a man of many talents and of many tastes, and this lecture was something he set up. As I mentioned, he can't join us, but his uh, very close friend, uh, Mel Rines, is here and uh, will be joining us, and we'll be sending him a DVD, which he can uh, observe at his leisure. So Mr. Gordon, welcome, and thank you again for your, your, your great generosity. So uh, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, briefly introduce our speaker. And you know, it's often said that, that success has many parents and failure is an orphan. And India, by all accounts, is one of the very remarkable success stories, uh, certainly in the last decade or so. The, uh, this is a country that, uh, for many years, was seen as a, almost a backwater, certainly in one where growth was stymied, uh, the future was uncertain. And now the rate of current rates of growth continue, and most people expect them to. We're talking about settings where people in a single lifetime will experience, on average, growth of 20, 30, even 50 times increase in income, something that's unprecedented in human history. This, of course, is the same pattern that's going on in China, though I think for very different reasons. It's something that maybe our guest may or may not comment on. Uh, but what is striking about our guest tonight also is that he has brought both really extraordinary ideals, ideas, uh, rigorous thought, as, we'll, as I'll mention in a moment, but also a recognition of the unique character, qualities, capacities, opportunities for India. And that combination is indeed rare, and it is the ultimate of leadership. He started his career in 1968 um, as an economist at the World Bank in Washington. And then he returned in 1979 to become the economic advisor to the Ministry of Finance. And over the next several years, he served in a variety of uh, critical positions, uh, ranging from including successful secretary to the prime minister and cabinet and counter secretary. Uh, as finance secretary in the Ministry of Finance in the early 1990s, he worked closely uh, with then finance minister uh, Manhan Singh uh, to conceive and execute India's economic reforms. Uh, in July 2001, he was appointed as the first director of the newly created Independent Evaluation Office of the, Inter of the International Monetary Fund, a, a post he held until July of 2004 to join then Prime Minister Singh's government as Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. Um, his role in that commission is to really serve as, as uh, he, he sees the commission as acting as a kind of think tank on economic policy uh, for the new government and really helps set the agenda in all kinds of levels. Uh, his focus is on the long term. Uh, the, he envisions that by 2035, India's GDP will be uh, behind that of the USA and China. I think the order is relevant. I think China will, may well be ahead of the United States at that stage. Um, and in 2007, he noted that there's a, there are, India's on the cusp of a remarkable group of penetration of technology, urbanization, expansion of markets, flow, flow of, of capital, and a whole variety of other things. You know, each year, uh, we send a fair number of our students to places like the World Bank. And we hope that as part of that activity, they will do well. 
We also hope that many of them will return to their countries and ultimately be leaders. If any of them turn out as well as Mr. Alawalia, I think we will be very proud and frankly, we will take full credit uh, <laughs> when such a thing happens. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce to you the Indian government's chief economic planner, Montek Singh Alawalia. Thank you, uh, Dean Elwood. Uh, this is a great honor and a privilege to address this audience in this very distinguished university. Uh, I've been given 25 minutes to speak on a rather huge subject, which is India's high growth trajectory challenges ahead. Uh, and I think in order to try to cover as much as possible, uh, I'll skip the usual introductory remarks and go straight to the subject. I think Dean Elwood has already made a reference to India's growth performance, uh, but it might be worth just putting a few numbers to it and setting the context, because I think the challenges that we face uh, are really challenges related to both sustaining that growth performance, maybe accelerating it, uh, and actually making sure that it achieves the objective uh, which people have in mind when they think of growth, which is to change and improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So I think the bottom line on that is that after lagging behind in the growth stakes in the 60s and the 70s, when India's GDP growth was around 3.5%, whereas uh, other developing countries were growing at over, over five, uh, India began to catch up in the 80s and had a growth rate of about 5.6%, which is actually better than that of other develop developing countries on average, but not all that fantastic. The many developing countries are doing much, much better. Uh, in the 1990s, again, uh, India did 5.6, not very different from the 1980s. And this is really the period when economic reforms uh, in India had begun. The real benefit, though, of the economic reforms uh, became evident only in the current decade. Uh, we've only got, uh, we'll be in the middle of the eighth year of it, but if you take the IMF projection for the current year, which is also pretty close to what we think is likely, then in the current, in, the, in this eight-year period, India's been growing at 7.1%. Uh, and if you look at the last five of those eight years, that growth rate is even better at 8.6. So, I mean, this is clearly a big change uh, in uh, actual performance. Uh, and the issue arises, does this mean that India is actually established now on a high growth trajectory? It's all, always music to our ears to hear all the remarks that we're really firmly established and whatever. But I think one must recognize that um, uh, scholars generally regard a sustained high growth performance as 7% uh, or more maintained over a 20 year period. So I think if you look at it from that point of view, we're sort of more or less halfway through uh, establishing that record. We have another 10 years to go. Uh, the good news is that most people who look at the economy think uh, that something very fundamental has changed that the policies that have been introduced have unleashed a lot of productive potential and that there's no reason uh, why the world should be different in the next 10 years. Now, of course, this lecture is about challenges to growth trajectories, which is typically a long-term issue. But, you know, I spent uh, all of Friday in New York uh, talking to a lot of financial people and so right now, the short-term prospects for the world economy and therefore for developing countries doesn't look all that good. I think it was Keynes who famously said that in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, we are sort of uh, now wondering, uh, can we survive the short run? At least in Wall Street, that's what they're wondering. So I'm very conscious that when I, when I talk about longer run challenges, I'm going to assume that there are a lot of smart people out there and while the short-run problems of the world economy really are bad, they actually will get overcome in a year to 18 months. Uh, obviously, if, 
if all these very smart people can't manage the world economy, then we do have to rethink our numbers. But I don't think that what I'm saying uh, would be much affected by simply a slowing down uh, for a year or even a year and a half. So one set of challenges uh, that India has is to firmly be able to sustain the present growth trajectory, which has actually been accelerating. As I said, in the last five years, the average growth rate is closer to around 8.6, 8.7%. There's a global upswing, which is now reversing itself. So this 8.7 maybe isn't an underlying growth capacity of 8.7. Maybe the underlying growth capacity is really 8%. And our objective, uh, as laid out in the 11th plan, 11th five-year plan that was approved very recently, was to go from 8% to hit 10% at the end of a five-year period and then average 9%. I think one of the interesting things is that India, um, over these years, has basically overtaken most of the developing countries in terms of growth performance. Of course, it's lagging behind China. China's growth rate remains very, very high indeed. But whereas the gap between India and China was very large, now the gap looks like just two percentage points. That's a lot, uh, but it's a, it's a different scenario. And I think there's a possibility that uh, Chinese and Indian growth rates should converge. Uh, China has been growing very rapidly for a long time. Uh, there will be a natural tendency to slow down. India has been accelerating. We hope it can continue to accelerate but they could both converge for, at 10% growth for quite some time. So that's really our, uh, what, one set of challenges relates to what does it take for India to be able to do that. The second set of challenges, in many ways more difficult, is what does India have to do to make growth more inclusive? Now, I think this is the distributional issue associated with growth, and it's always been there. I mean, if you look at the whole development literature, there's always been figuring. Uh, traditionally, it has figured in terms of whether growth benefits everybody equally or not. Uh, more recently, in the international literature, it would surface in the form of, is it removing absolute poverty? Uh, there's a great deal of focus on whether growth is actually making a dent on poverty. But I think we need to keep in mind that uh, when a, an economy grows very rapidly, like 8% is certainly rapid, then it's not just a question of whether growth trickles down. A change which is that rapid is also actually disruptive. You do not get an 8% growth with everybody doing whatever they're doing and just sort of having an, a growth in productivity evenly spread. You get an 8% growth when new opportunities arise, structural changes take place, whole old ways of doing things kind of go out of business, new industries turn up, and that's a, inherently a disruptive process so that not only people may not benefit equally, but at least some occupations may simply disappear. So there is a real issue uh, whether internally uh, there is some disruption to some part of the social and the political uh, uh, framework. Also in a democracy, people are very aware of what's happening. And I think when uh, growth in India was 5%, 5.5%, it still wasn't much to write home about. I mean, India did better than the average of developing countries, but we were just getting into the top 10 uh, in the 80s and 90s, and nobody talked about growth. Uh, when India's growth performance becomes second only to China for a large country, then it focuses people's attention that something wonderful is happening. And in a democracy, at least, I mean, everybody who isn't experiencing an equally wonderful time naturally raises questions that, is this a fair process? So the whole issue is not just an issue of poverty alleviation. It's an issue of fairness. And fairness can be defined to mean whatever you like. It could mean, for example, that's all very well, but my region isn't growing. And actually, your region could be one of the richest regions in the country, but just isn't benefiting from growth. That can cause people to be unhappy. Sometimes, if, you, if you're in a socially fragmented country, as we are, and there are communities, for example, that have been historically discriminated against, then the focus on inclusiveness is not about poverty alleviation. They're not just saying, how about bringing us above the poverty line? They're really saying, how about having us equally represented in every income decile? So like it's a fair share 
of every position in an otherwise unequal distribution. So it's a very complex, it's a very complex set of pressures that get unleashed. And that's the second set of challenges. How do we ensure that not only we try to accelerate growth, which is clearly a stated objective, but also make sure that the growth is of the kind that would actually be inclusive. Now, in, in listing all this, uh, let me just briefly talk about our experience on the inclusiveness portion. Uh, because everybody talks about poverty as the key indicator, I'll just use that to anchor the discussion a little bit. Uh, the fact is in India, during the last uh, 10, 20 years, uh, the incidence of poverty, by which I mean the percentage of the population below a fixed poverty line, has been steadily going down. But I think it's also true that it's not been going down fast enough. I mean, the fact, according to the data we have, and by the way, there's a whole slew of uh, research on the quality of this data, where some people saying, well, the data don't tell the right story, et cetera, but you, know, you never know where to come out on that. So I'm, I'm accepting the data as they stand. And w the picture that comes out is, yes, poverty is going down. A anybody who says this is not having an impact on poverty is just misrepresenting the situation. But I think poverty is not going down fast enough. I mean, like over a 10-year period from 94 to 2004, you have poverty going down from 36% to 27.5%. That is not adequately impressive to anyone, even at home. Uh, the second problem is that you know the definition of poverty changes. People are not interested anymore in whether your consumption level has gone above some minimum which is arbitrarily defined. And quite apart from the fact that as the country becomes richer, it's logical to raise your poverty level. That's an independent point. I think there's a more fundamental thing, and that is that uh, uh, the poverty is not just a matter of whether you're getting enough income. Uh, the old idea of trickle down uh, was linked to an image of whether income generation is taking place lower down in the spectrum, and the answer to that, quite frankly, is it is. Uh, but what is not happening is you're not getting an adequate supply of public services, which is an essential part of well-being. And by that, for example, I mean health and education. Uh, these cannot be provided by income because they're not traditionally purchased except at the highest income levels. They're meant to be provided as public services uh, provided through the state in one way or the other. Uh, and if you look at those indicators, um, India's poverty in terms of scale is more than 27.5%. I mean, for example, illiteracy is probably of the order of uh, something of the order of 35%. Uh, that's certainly one concept of minimum, minimum achievement. Uh, if you look at... Uh, the number of women who give birth uh, in, a, in a safe or an assisted environment, not necessarily in an institution, but with skilled birth assistance, that, that percentage is only about 50%. Now again, there's huge variation across the country. I mean, some parts of the country is as high as 70 and others is as low as 30. Uh, but clearly, you can say that on that criterion, half the country isn't getting what it should be getting. If you look at immunization, a very low cost, very basic uh, public service, about half the kids are getting immunized. Again, in parts of the country, 70%, in other parts, 30%. So I think there is a, a broadening of the concept of poverty to mean, to include deprivation from essential services, which are not provided by income trickling down. They have to be provided by public service systems getting out there and delivering the goods. And I think in that respect, uh, the scale of the problem is larger. Now, the good news is that in all these areas, uh, the situation is improving. I mean, if you look at these indicators 10 years ago, they were much worse. So even in these areas, there's an improvement. But I think as people begin to focus on whether uh, the system is doing enough for me, uh, there are too many people who would be able to say that we're not delivering the minimum that we need. It's a very strong, a very strong uh, uh, both perception and I would say also reality. So that's the challenge. What, how, what, is it, what are we going to do as we try to get the economic growth going? Uh, 
And let me say that the economic growth is absolutely essential because the ability to do something for the poor is absolutely crucially conditioned on being able to generate income, jobs, and resources through the tax uh, take. And without growth, we don't get that. But it's, it's not just a question of let's have any kind of growth and then uh, fix what needs to be fixed. I think there are certain types of growth processes which more naturally lend themselves to a broader spread of benefits. And the name of the game is, can we uh, push the system in that direction? So what are the challenges uh, with this perspective? And clearly, the first challenge is the issue of sustaining growth and accelerating it. I think this is, in many ways, the easiest uh, thing to do, because over the last seven or eight years, uh, the policies that we initiated in the 1980s in a very gentle sort of way and then accelerated in the 1990s clearly have produced growth. I think when I go back uh, in my mind to what the situation was like in 1991 when the major reforms were introduced, there was a huge amount of criticism in India and also abroad. People uh, said this is just the Washington consensus type of reforms. They're going to ruin the economy. Uh, you will have the same outcome that you had in Latin America, where you had the lost decade, or in Africa, where for 10 years nothing happened. Uh, India will be worse off in terms of economic growth, and would also the poor would suffer. Now, what has turned out quite clearly is that the allegation that this would be bad for growth is clearly wrong. Uh, growth has taken off, it needs to be sustained, but uh, nobody has any doubt now that the government of India knows how to generate growth. The question really is, is it, is it a growth that is doing all the good things we want done? So really from a sustaining point of view, continuation of those policies is very important. So what are those policies? I think what India did is not very different from what other countries uh, have been doing. Uh, it can be characterized by quite a conscious effort to deregulate the economy, to have a greater reliance on market forces, to have a much greater reliance on the private sector as a dynamic force uh, supporting private investment and creating an investment environment that would be favorable. Uh, a conscious effort to open up the economy and integrate with the globe, opening up foreign trade, reducing trade barriers, inviting foreign investment, initially in the form of foreign direct investment, later in a gradual way, capital flows, clearly opening up tremendously to technology. These are all fairly standard uh, recipes. I think the difference is that they were done in a manner which was very homegrown, which took account of local sensitivities. Uh, it was not imposed from outside as some kind of a predetermined template. And very often compromises were struck in the sense that uh, aspects that were locally controversial uh, were allowed to be discussed. Uh, we sort of took uh, one step forward, one step sideways, and then moved forward when a consensus could be built, et cetera. Very frustrating process and a process that takes a long time. But I think, uh, as a result, it genuinely built a, a greater consensus within the country uh, that this is the right way to go. And actually, since 1991, there have been several elections in the country and several changes of government. I mean, the reforms were started by the Congress party. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who is now the prime minister, was then the finance minister and generally regarded as the architect of the reforms. That government was replaced by a left-of-center coalition for about three years. Uh, while they were very critical of the reforms when they were being done, they didn't actually reverse them, though I think they sort of slightly lost direction, if you like, but no real reversal took place. They were then replaced by a BJP coalition, which, for example, had very strongly criticized foreign, the opening up to uh, foreign markets, but nevertheless, they too continued the reform process. And, uh, uh, and now, of course, you have a Congress-led coalition back in its last year in office. So you, we've, we've, as it were, gone through a democratic process where different groups, different parties have been uh, involved in government, and every one of these parties is actually in power in one state or the other. So to look at whether India is uh, accepting the reforms message, we don't have to look at what the federal government is doing. 
We should also look at what's happening at state governments. And I believe that uh, in this period, this basic message that uh, a private sector-led growth process in a context where you open up and integrate with the world is good for India, and that India has the capacity to exploit the global opportunities that are thrown up, this has got very well established. So this, will, this has to be continued, it will continue. I think it needs to go into a second stage of reforms, uh, which are a little more complex, uh, issues of legal reforms, continuing the reform of the financial sector. As you can see right now, I mean, uh, all financial sector, they're very unstable, so we should be very careful about what we do, but we're very far from having a fully developed financial sector. That's an important issue. Uh, and of course, things like bankruptcy laws, et cetera. All of these are currently being discussed in India, uh, and I would hope that, I expect that there will be forward movement in them. Second very important challenge relates to agriculture. I think that one of the reasons why um, India's economic reform, uh, economic growth in the last 10 years didn't actually uh, lead to as marked a distributional uh, positive outcome as one would have hoped, is that for some reason agriculture got neglected. Uh, some, between 1980 and the middle of the 1990s, agriculture grew at about 3.6%. After that, it, start, it slowed down sharply and grew only at 2%. Uh, we have set a target of 4%. Uh, during the life of this government, in the last three years, it has picked up to about 3.6, but to be fair, you need a much longer time horizon to really know whether you've got back on a high growth scenario. I think the agricultural uh, issue is important not just for growth. I mean, agriculture is only 20% of GDP, but it accounts for 50% or so of the labor force. So if agriculture were to increase from, its growth rate were to increase from 2% to 4%, uh, since it's only 20% share in GDP, the extra two percentage points will make a direct contribution only of 0.4%. And maybe with some sort of uh, stimulated effects in rural areas of non-agriculture, that 0.4 could become 0.7. That's not small when the name, if the name of the game is to go from eight to 10, uh, that, that ex, out of that extra two percentage points, uh, 0.7 could come from the direct and the indirect effects of getting the agricultural economy right. More importantly, it would directly benefit half the population. So I think from a distributional point of view, I would put that very high on the agenda and the government has Ha is engaged in basically redefining our agricultural strategy. And mind you, if you look at the short-term news, all the talk about uh, global food shortages, the need to focus on food production, particularly for a large country like India, is overwhelming. But even so, actually all we need in terms of food grain production is about 2.5% growth per year, with population growing at only 1.5. Uh, the rest of this 4% is going to come from non-food grain agriculture, which could grow between six and eight percent and has been. That means vegetables, uh, livestock, dairying, fisheries, etc. Now these kinds of products are very different from grain. They're all perishable and therefore the logistics of getting them from the farm to market involves a lot more pri private investment. Uh, the logistics of making people grow what people want, whether it's for exports or for agro-processing or just for the table, uh, requires market judgment. So the entire modernization of the logistics come marketing chain is a major feature uh, of what we need to do uh, in what very often is called the second or the third revolution in the agricultural sector. And that is underway. Um, it is taking place, and I believe that uh, that has to be combined with a lot more investment uh, in irrigation and also in improved water management. I think looking long term in India, water is a critical resource um, for any agricultural society and we will remain an impo importantly agricultural for quite some time, but also for industrial societies, harnessing the available water efficiently is going to be a major challenge. Uh, and 
personally, I think that in a way, water is an even bigger challenge than energy. Uh, one reason is that uh, people kind of believe that you know, energy should be priced. I mean, we muck it up every now and then, but nobody expects to get energy free. But people do expect to get water free. And that's, uh, if it's a resource that's becoming scarce over time uh, and yet is not priced, the whole issue of how do you ensure that there's going to be inv enough investment going into conserving and mobilizing it, and also how do you ensure that it's allocated efficiently is a major economic problem. So I think that one of the things we have to do in the agricultural area is to rethink our water strategy and water policy, which runs into many complex issues. I mean, for example, uh, the disputes that you very often have uh, between two different states, upper riparian and lower riparian, can be as strong as they would be across countries. So it's a major issue uh, that has to be addressed. I call that a significant challenge. But I think all told, we know what the dimensions of the problem are, and I'm quite hopeful that that'll get done. Another important challenge in order to maintain and then to accelerate growth is really the uh, development of infrastructure. I think anyone who's visited India and visited other fast-growing emerging markets uh, would, would come to the conclusion that the infrastructure in this country is much below what it should be uh, for an e economy getting into the emerging market uh, area. And I think that's recognized in India, and our own objectives actually are to increase investment in infrastructure in the next five years from a base of 5% to something like 9%. So it's a nine percentage point increase in investment in infrastructure. Uh, much of that would have to be public investment, but a lot of it can be private investment. And this is a change from the past, because in the past, all investment in infrastructure was uh, government, now we are actively pursuing the possibility of bringing in private sector investment in a whole lot of infrastructure sectors like ports, roads, airports, railways, telecom, electric power. I don't have the time to go into this, but I think basically what I like to say is that in each one of these areas, we have tried to anticipate what is the scope for attracting private investment and what's the set of policies that would make it attractive for private investors to come. Uh, and the early results are actually quite promising in the sense that in each one of these sectors, we have private investors coming forth and setting up projects. And many of them are operating and making money. Uh, the real question is, will we attract as much investment as we hope? Uh, but certainly we've got past the early stage of trying to formulate policies and we've also got to the stage where we can see that the policies are working, but we just have to make sure that they work as much as we want them to. So I think infrastructure is a, ma is a major challenge. Uh, yet another area which is, and, and infrastructure is very important for inclusiveness also, because uh, a lot of the problem of backward areas, uh, regions that are not well developed, are essentially linked to the lack of infrastructure availability. Uh, nothing would more, more easily leverage private investment into the less developed parts of the country than a serious effort at developing infrastructure. So uh, rather than try to sort of put in public investment in productive activities in backward areas, what the government should be doing is either investing directly in infrastructure if it can't get the private sector to do it, or leveraging private sector money through one kind of incentive or another so that that happens. And we think that that is possible. Uh, health and education, I mentioned earlier, are critical areas. I think India's indicators. Uh, in education, I think we had a fairly good performance in the higher education level, not so good at primary and secondary education. But today, even the higher education is desperately in need of expansion. Uh, I think India produced more skills than she needed when we were growing at 4%, uh, about the right uh, num uh, volume of skills when we were growing at 6%. We're not producing enough for an economy growing at 8%. That is very evident in the labor market today. So uh, a major effort at uh, a 10, 20 year plan to develop a, a much expanded educational infrastructure which, in which government will have to spend a lot of money. 
At the same time, create a fra framework in which private initiative can also be encouraged. In the, under the law in India, it's possible to have private universities or public universities. And actually, we have quite a lot of private universities, especially in the last 10 years, where government funding for higher education has been strained, so the private sector has expanded. But none of these universities, I think, are really geared to produce the quality of education that we need. I think the big problem in India is not uh, quantity. Uh, the government intends to put more money into it, but how to evolve a framework in which the money that is spent leads to good quality, whether it's in school level or in uh, edu uh, higher education, that's a critical issue. And I think this, this is very directly connected again with inclusiveness. Because education is one thing where uh, all the evidence suggests that people know that education is good for your children's future. And there's lots of evidence that uh, poorer people are actually willing to pay uh, to send their kids to private schools because of the belief that the private schools are actually better than the public schools. I mean, educationists tell me, by the way, that this belief is totally unfounded. Because what actually happens is not that the private school is necessarily better, uh, but it's just that all the motivated people in any case want to go to private schools, and it's the whole, that whole family motivation which is reflected in the children's behavior. The kids would do just as well if they went to public school, but the fact is that they go to private schools, and I think we can only change them if visibly the quality of public schools increases. It's not generally realized, incidentally, that in India, uh, the percentage of children who go to private schools is much higher than the United States. 97% of American kids go to what you would call a public school. Uh, in India, about 70% uh, go to a public school, and virtually everybody in urban areas who is above a certain level prefers to go to a private school. So there is, a, there is an issue there that for inclusiveness we need. I think people begin to recognize that, you know, it's not enough just to send kids to school. If you deny them quality education at the school level, they're not going to get into university. And if in a liberalized environment, it's, it's the higher skills that give them access to higher level jobs, you really need to equalize opportunity through the school system at the lowest level, especially in rural areas. And this is a very big challenge. Now, uh, again, the government intends to spend a lot of money on it. Uh, but that's actually the smaller part of the problem. And we will spend the money, we have allocated the money, but uh, whether we can bring about the organizational and system improvements needed to improve the quality of education is a long-term task. I mean, even rich countries are not satisfied with the quality of schooling they get uh, uh, for their children. So I imagine that we'll be stuck with this for the next 30, 40 years. Uh, we shouldn't get too depressed about that, but really um, every five years some reasonable targets that would ensure that the quality of schooling improves would be very important. And the same thing is really true for health. India has a very, very extensive private sector healthcare system which is developing in many ways, uh, but what we need is basic public health, and that can only be provided again uh, by the government. Uh, two other things that I want to mention very briefly, because I'm now running out of time. Obviously, energy uh, is going to be a constraint, but I don't think India has any new... There's nothing new that India can do that other countries are not doing. This is, this is really the world's problem. Uh, and the main thing I think we should do, uh, and we haven't, I think, done as good a job of it as we should, is to make sure that energy is not cheap. Uh, so passing on high energy prices is a major challenge. That's important for the climate, that's important for energy efficiency. Of course, it's very difficult, uh, as in the case of food. In the short run, we've seen, within the last 18 months, a huge increase in crude oil prices. Uh, and that is now reflected also in an increase in coal prices. So sooner or later, uh, these prices have to feed back into the system. And we have to recognize that uh, higher, oil, higher energy prices will be good for finding sources of energy, encouraging uh, alternative energy, putting more money into research that will uh, support alternative energy sources, and also increase energy efficiency. Uh, but that's certainly uh, uh, an area where uh, we've been caught, like many other countries, with a big increase in prices that still has to be passed through the system. 
Another structural issue that India faces is urbanization. I, I mentioned earlier that in agriculture, we're thinking of a 4% growth of output as feasible. You know, a 4% growth of output in agriculture isn't going to generate all that much rural prosperity unless we can move people out of agriculture into non-agriculture. Because if agriculture goes at 4% and non-agriculture at 10%, which is roughly what would be needed to achieve 8-9% uh, uh, GDP growth, then um, it has to be the case that this must be accompanied by a population shift. That's happened all over the world. And India was slow in doing this because our GDP growth wasn't very rapid. That will now accelerate. So I think uh, we need, we need a, a non-agricultural growth, which is job creating. And that brings in the whole challenge of uh, rigidities in our labor market, which is a very difficult, politically contentious issue. But I think uh, somebody will have to bite the bullet at some point. But associated with that is really the trend towards urbanization. Not all non-agriculture is urban. And one can imagine a situation where quite a lot of non-agricultural activity takes place in rural areas, uh, and certainly better road connectivity, electricity in rural areas, broadband access, all these things make it possible for a lot of economic activity to take place without everybody having to come to the cities. But nevertheless, it is our expectation that in 20 years' time, uh, India's urban population will grow from 30% to 40% at least. Now, 10% uh, for a population by then, it really means another 150 million people have to be in cities. And that's a humongous job in terms of creating cities, creating the infrastructure of cities. Uh, and linked to that is, the, I think, the, uh, a, a real challenge in, in governance issues. Because you know, we are not organized in a manner where city government uh, is fully responsible to the local population. I mean, uh, in this respect, India is different from China. The uh, governmental system remains at the federal or the state level, uh, but uh, being head of a city is not an important job. I mean, like uh, in China, if you are the mayor of Shanghai, uh, that's a very important political job. You do a good job as mayor of Shanghai, you might move up and become prime minister. There's no such thing in India. I think this raises the question that, you know, can we have five to ten of the world's largest cities in a globalized environment where we are attracting foreign investment and everybody would expect these cities to be sort of compa comparable to what cities are elsewhere? Uh, can we do that without a change in the governance system where people who run the cities are el elected to run the cities and actually responsible to the citizens of the cities. At the moment, uh, there's much too large a role for the state government, the pro province government, uh, in the, what happens in a city. So that's another big, uh, big challenge. Well, you know, there's no dearth of challenges. One can go on and on, but I have a time constraint. Uh, the only additional point I want to make is that all of this suggests that there's a big job for the government to do because I keep talking about infrastructure, health, education. It's a different job from what it was earlier. We're not talking about the government setting up factories or investing in steel or cement or anything. But the scale of government involvement has to go up. And for that, I think resources will be very crucial. Now, the good news on that is that uh, with the growth we've had, uh, tax mobilization has been very good. In the last five years or so, we've had an increase in the total tax revenue of about four percentage points of GDP. And what we need is to carry this forward into the next five years. So a combination of more tax revenues coming out of the growth process, which means that tax reform continues to be very important. I think it's done a very good job so far. One of the key elements of the economic reforms was lower the tax rates, have better systems, more transparency, more IT, and it'll lead in due course to better compliance. And that has actually worked. The ratio of tax revenues to GDP has been going up. Uh, but I think we need to, it needs to go up much more. And I think linked to that is really a withdrawal of subsidies. Uh, all the talk uh, about investment, which the government has to do in infrastructure, in agriculture, in irrigation, in watershed management, 
I mean, this would be a much better way of using resources than the present subsidies, uh, which are supposed to support uh, subsidizing fertilizer, subsidizing power, uh, subsidizing water. Uh, but these are politically extremely difficult things. And I mean, uh, in a way, we're in the last year of a five-year period. There's an election coming next year, and I don't expect that uh, that's not a period usually characterized by governments withdrawing subsidies. But the agenda after that, whoever's, whoever's running the government, I think uh, rationalizing subsidies is going to be a big issue. It's not a very easy thing to do because, uh, uh, I mean, even if you were to say that I'm taking away these subsidies and using this money visibly for the benefit of the same people uh, and set up accounting mechanisms that people could see that that is happening, I mean, it looks very good in an economics 101 class, but politically is virtually impossible. So I don't know how we're going to do it, quite honestly. I mean, we're working on it. But I think ultimately, these bullets are only bitten uh, when, uh, when governments sort of are more or less forced to take these decisions. And I think that that's going to be, that's an important part uh, of the whole dynamics of how policy changes. It doesn't change. Uh, in any rational sort of way. I think lots and lots of discussion and somebody says, right, this is the time to do it. So uh, what that means is we need to do all these things and we also need a lot of good luck and we need a lot of good political management. But I think the important thing is that uh, what has been achieved so far does suggest that it's possible. I know a lot of people used to say to me 10 years ago that it's impossible in a democracy to make changes. And that is clearly not the case. It is possible, uh, and I think you have to seize your opportunity. You never quite know when you can do it, but if you're ready to pounce whenever an opportunity arises, I'm reasonably confident uh, that we'll be able to do the job. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we do have some time for questions. And we have microphones located in four locations, one right here, one here, another there, and one there. And just uh, if you could queue up behind them. I just would like to remind everyone in the audience the basic rules for questions at the Kennedy School. Uh, the first rule is that questions are short. Uh, actually, that's the second rule I keep forgetting. The first rule is actually to identify yourself. The second rule is that they are short and contain one question, one idea. And the third and most important rule is they end with a question mark. Um, and so for that, let me start right over here. Hello, good evening. My name is Shreya Maheshwari, and I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm from New Delhi, India. And my question was basically um, regarding the proposed sort of uh, social security benefits and the whole kind of social safety net that the government has been talking about for a while. If there's, you know, the major challenges and obstacles that you envision that India will face in actually providing that for more than, you know, the majority of the people who are living in villages and the rural areas. A uh, very, very good question, actually. And I think, um, I mean, I'm remiss in not having mentioned it as one of the key, key elements. Uh, one of the things that we don't have, many developing countries don't have, is a, a, a basic social safety net so that as you go through the otherwise often disruptive process of rapid growth, uh, there's a kind of a safety net that prevents people from getting hit too hard. Well, the government has, in fact, introduced several key elements of such a social safety net. Some of them are a little different from normal uh, uh, normal measures. One very important measure is what is called the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. This is, you know, instead of just providing a dole to people unemployed, it provides an opportunity for anyone in rural areas who lacks work to demand as a matter of right that they can get 100 days of work at, at manual labor uh, at the minimum wage. So it's, it's built, built into the system is uh, an incentive that unless you really wanted work, you wouldn't do it. Um, but it has worked actually quite well. And the, the idea is to link, link this work to the kind of asset creation activity uh, which is necessary to enhance land productivity in any case. And most importantly, water, water management. I mean, we've defined a large number of schemes and in every, um, local council village area, 
people will identify in a systematic way what are the different water conservation schemes that are needed. And as people turn up wanting work, uh, they will be given work to implement these schemes. So that's a very big uh, program. Uh, we always had employment programs before, okay? But earlier, the employment programs were budget-driven. I mean, there was a budget, somebody was asked to go and spend it. This is a rights-driven program in the sense that, you know, you, if you want employment and you're not getting it, you can go along to your local council, register there, and say, look, within 15 days, I need work. And once you're registered, they will find you work for 100 days. So it's, a, it's a quite different from simply having an employment program. That's uh, one element. Second element is that we have expanded the national old age uh, pension scheme. Uh, today, earlier, there was a very limited pension uh, available to people who are deemed to be destitute. Now, it's anyone who comes below the poverty line, which is about 27.5% of the population. When they reach a particular age, I think 65 at present, thereafter, they're all entitled to a pension, which is double the previous pension. It's a form of support for older population, and it kind of gives them a much greater sense of uh, uh, self-regard and regard within the family and so forth. So that's, that's a new thing, and that's entirely funded by the government. Uh, the third initiative, which is quite important in the area of health, is a new scheme of health insurance. You know, health is one of, I mean, health events are very often a cause of precipitating people who are not in poverty in, in, uh, uh, into poverty in a way they can't get out of. Uh, and I think this has become more serious because people are now aware that uh, many diseases that they have are actually curable. I mean, earlier they just didn't know. Now there's a demand for that kind of health. So what, what we've got is a scheme which says that anybody below the poverty line would be eligible for a national health insurance scheme where the central government will pay 75% of the insurance premium and the state government will contribute 25%. So the state government has to trigger this offer, tie up with an insurance company, either a public or a private insurance company, and the arrangement is that the insurance will cover you for hospital activity, not for outpatient stuff. For that, you go to the local clinic, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. But if you, need a, if you need medical attention that requires hospitalization, then they've worked out a protocol that for different diseases, different types of surgery, uh, different hospitals will sign up for the program, promising to provide the service at a pre-stated price. And the, the innovative thing is that the hospitals that provide it don't have to be only public. So you can have a public sector hospital signing up, you can have a private sector hospital signing up. The patient who's covered no longer has to go only to a public sector hospital which doesn't charge. They can go to a private sector hospital if they've signed up for that insurance scheme. And you know, some of the early results uh, seem to be working quite well. I mean, in Andhra Pradesh, for example, I mean, what we've done actually is to create a national template for something which the state government of Andhra Pradesh was doing experimentally anyway. Uh, and they tried it in a few districts. They signed up a lot of private hospitals, some government hospitals, and it seems to work well. So that's a very major development. I mean, when it's fully rolled out and implemented, we would be ending up covering something of the order of 300 million people uh, with health insurance. And of course, linked to that will be all kinds of other improvements, developing smart cards, which will keep a record of their health. And I think the whole insurance cost of it will over time improve as the data collected, is collected. So there are three very major social, social security type uh, initiatives that we've taken. Right up here. Hi, my name is Suvrat. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Physics here. So I just wanted to preface my question with two quick statistics. And the first one is that if you look at India's position in the Human Development Index, which may not be a very good index, in the past 10 years, it actually dropped from about 124 to about 128 out of 177 countries. Uh, secondly, you had a discussion about poverty rates, which I found somewhat disingenuous because, as you know very well, 
Poverty rates in India are defined in terms of whether people get a basic minimum calorie requirement. And NSS data shows that about 70% of people don't get the basic minimum 2,400 kilocalories per day. So now this is not a question of chance. This is a question of design. And what are the systemic factors in the reform process that you have implemented that have allowed this huge dichotomy of this happening on one side and this huge growth rate on the other side? And your proposals seem to be more of the same. But what are the systemic changes that you're planning to implement that will end this dichotomy? Yeah, um, two responses. On the Human Development Index, you know, uh, if you read the Human Development Report, they will tell you that in order to see whether things are improving, look at the Human Development Index over time. No use looking at the rank because all kinds of small countries either come in, get covered, or don't get covered. I don't think there's any evidence that the Human Development Index in India shows a deterioration. It's true that the rank may have slipped because there are more countries being covered, and that's very clear. As far as poverty is concerned, I think it's wrong to conclude that the poverty is being caused by the reforms. There was much more of it before the reforms. What you're really asking is why are the reforms not leading to a more rapid decline in poverty? That's fair, I think. And in my view, uh, the one systemic thing that I feel uh, should have been done and which we now think we are doing is much greater focus on agriculture. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier that after the middle of the 1990s, uh, Indian agricultural growth decelerated. There's no justification for that. Uh, productivity, I mean, detailed studies have shown that land productivity in many parts of India with existing technology, providing we use the right seeds, the right information, and all the backup support of uh, supplementary public investment in irrigation, et cetera, or water management, can be increased by 80 to 100%. So really, the name of the game is, what is the mix of measures we've, we are now putting in place, which we think will close this huge productivity gap? And I think, well, I mean, I, I can refer you to lots and lots of government documentation. Is it more of the same? Uh, the honest truth is that, you know, uh, it's never the words that are different because people always use it. You have to just see what happens on the ground. And my feeling is that it is different, uh, but it'll take too long for me to explain those differences. The test will be in another, already in the last three years, Indian agricultural growth is better than it was in the previous seven. Uh, the statistics also show improvements in things like farmer suicides and what have you. The change that is taking place in the global food production setup will in fact alter the relative price in favor of agriculture. This creates a real tension though. The short run problem is how to keep food prices under control so that you don't have urban riots as you're having in some developing countries. But in the longer run, you need to transmit uh, this price signal uh, so that actually farmers end up earning a higher level of income. And I think that will happen, basically. All right, Pierre. Hi, my name is Kaveri, and I'm a graduate student at uh, the grad school here in neuroscience. Uh, so you talked about attractive, attracting private sector investment. And historically, that's gone hand in hand with a few things, such as the slashing of labor laws. Uh, there's talk now, secondly, of uh, establishing special economic zones with huge tax um, cuts for um, private sector investment over there, which has been widely condemned by many economists, as you know, including Mr. Chidambaram. And thirdly, the forgiveness of corporate misconduct. For example, re-entry re negotiations with Dow Chemicals, whose subsidiary is still criminally responsible uh, and, and liable for having slashed safety standards in order to maintain profits to the detriment of which, several which thousands of deaths. So could you please... What was the last point you were saying? Uh, corporate misconduct, the forgiveness of corporate misconduct, such as with Dow Chemicals, negotiations for its re-entry into India, despite its subsidiary being still legally liable for, and criminally liable for cutting safety standards. So my question is, how permissive should we be with respect to each of these three things? Uh, and do you think the permissiveness that has been shown so far is merited? Yeah, well, let's do that uh, in reverse sequence. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any uh, forgiveness of corporate misconduct. 
Uh, I'm aware that many NGOs have been lobbying the government of India to take punitive action against Dow Chemicals. In fact, they have taken Dow Chemicals to court uh, on the grounds that Dow bought up Union Carbide after the Bhopal, several years after the Bhopal tragedy, but that they have, a, as a result of being the owners of Union Carbide, they retain the liability to undo the damage that was being done because of the chemicals that are leaching into the ground. So there's no forgiveness of, uh, that, that case is going on in court. So it would be quite improper for me to pronounce on it, but any notion that we are forgiving, uh, I mean, that, that's a court matter. I don't believe that, uh, it's not our view that Dow Chemicals has actually violated any laws of the government of India because it wasn't, it didn't own Union Carbide when the accident happened. So the fact that they're investing in India, I mean, is not something that we can be objecting to. They're not actually guilty of any obvious thing which would make you take, I'm, I'm amazed though that, I mean, there is a huge amount of uh, anger at Dow Chemicals here, to which I neither want to add nor detract, because the matter is in court. I just want to make a, make a limited point. I do not believe that there has been any forgiveness of misconduct or even establishment of misconduct as of now. So I think that's, uh, uh, that's the answer that one ha uh, you have to consider, whether it's true or not. Uh, it's true that Dow Chemicals, uh, subsid other subsidiaries of Dow Chemicals operate in India. Uh, when I say it's quite possible that some of them are involved in some litigation here, there, and everywhere, that has to be left to the court. So I don't think you should read anything uh, from any of these uh, uh, particular events as if it implies some kind of a government strategy. Uh, certainly not a government strategy that's driven by uh, uh, economic reform. I mean, uh, that would be my request. Second, on the SEZs, the Special Economic Zone, that's a very straightforward uh, uh, program of uh, trying to encourage people to build high-class infrastructure associated with some tax advantages. Uh, you know, I think there is a, in my view, there's a bit of a fallacy in the argument that this is leading to a huge amount of loss of tax revenue, because it, the notion that it is leading to tax revenue implies that if you didn't have these special economic zones, all this investment would still come. Uh, quite frankly, if that is the case, it's a very silly idea, but I don't think that's our view. Uh, uh, go to anyone in India and they'll tell you what is lacking is high quality infrastructure. So the, the basic strategy is, yes, they have some tax advantage, but uh, I don't think it's a tax advantage that's hurting uh, the fiscal situation. Now, your first question was on labor laws. You know, I just want to put it to you that the government of India is absolutely uncompromising about the importance of labor laws and labor protection. But India's labor laws are rigid in the extreme, much more so than any other country, including China. Now, it is not my view that when you have a set of laws that don't match up with what is contemporary global practice, you should not alter them. When I'm talking about relaxing labor laws, I'm not talking about relaxing laws that have anything to do with minimum wages, anything to do with worker safety, anything to do with worker benefits, anything to do with maternity benefits, or any of those things. The issue really is that in India, if you're a company and you find an adverse turn in the market, you cannot retrench labor without the permission of the state government. This is an extreme rigidity which I think many people will tell you if you have laws like that, people will not go into labor intensive manufacturing. We want to pull 100 million people out of agriculture so that people in agriculture can get a better living. We can only do that if we can provide employment in non-agriculture. And we will not be able to provide employment in non-agriculture in employment intensive industries if the present labor laws continue. That is what all the businessmen I talk to tell me. So I, I suggest that you look at it from that perspective. And if you come to a different conclusion, send me an email. I'll be happy to interact with you. Right over here. 
I'm Poonam Mutreja, and I'm a visiting uh, fellow at the, inst uh, at the uh, Ash Institute at the Kennedy School, and I live in India. Um, moving you from corporate misconduct to corporate social responsibility, you've talked about um, uh, creating an environment, policy environment, for greater investment by the uh, corporate sector in uh, infrastructure and many other areas. How about thinking about policies for greater investment by the corporate sector in the social sector. America is a case in point. MacArthur Foundation, where I work, the Rockefeller Foundation, these are foundations that weren't set up by philanthropists. They were set up because they, the, the American environment is very conducive to uh, setting up philanthropies. And Kennedy School definitely has also benefited from that. And uh, my, second question, my second point on that is, and perhaps then we will get greater investment in the public sector too. You, you've been talking about private-public partnerships in India. Um, um, you know, instead of the private sector coming and setting up English medium schools and making money out of it, how about us trying to create a policy environment where they invest in the infra, huge infrastructure we have for both health and education? No, I mean, I, I don't have any difference of view with you on that. Um, our policy certainly encourages, uh, well, we applaud philanthropy. I'm not sure whether there are specific things we should do which would encourage it more, but if you have some ideas, let me know. Uh, but definitely, co uh, any corporation interested in doing work of a philanthropic nature and setting up not-for-profit activity in health and education is absolutely free to do so. And the many of them are, are doing it. Very innovative. Sorry? They're very constraining. Sorry? The laws in India are very constraining, the tax laws. Tax laws, you mean? In other words, what you're saying is the tax benefit for philanthropy is not adequate. Yeah. That's possible. Well, I, yeah, that, quite an interesting point, actually, but we can talk about it later. Right over here. My name is Kieran Bott. I'm a sophomore at the college, and I'm with the South Asian Men's Collective. And um, a, a few years ago, when the U.S. and India were negotiating the, uh, the nuclear deal, uh, there's a lot of focus on um, the benefits or the drawbacks of nuclear energy. And I was just wondering whether the Indian government has put a priority on, um, on nuclear power as kind of a solution to this uh, electrical power infrastructure and um, just what you see as the, the advantages and disadvantages of that. No, our view on that's very clear. I mean, uh, definitely nuclear, particularly as we move into a world in which uh, reducing carbon footprints is important, uh, nuclear power is a clean form of energy uh, from that point of view, and we are definitely interested in utilizing whatever resources we have. I think the nuclear deal, uh, if it is finally, if it finally goes through, uh, will in fact make a huge difference. You know, the, uh, it's not a secret, but the difficulty with the nuclear deal doesn't arise in the U.S., it arises in India. I mean, we are a coalition government. And at the moment, uh, one of our supporting parties has very strong reservations about the deal. And even the opposition, the BJP, has opposed the deal. It's not very clear to me why. I mean, I think these are mistaken perceptions. But uh, um, the facts of the matter are, uh, faced with that kind of political opposition, unless the circumstances change, and I'm sure they're discussing it all the time, uh, the government would not have would not be in the position of a commanding a majority. So the present situation is the government is discussing. Uh, obviously, you discuss only with your supporting party. You don't discuss with opposition. The opposition have no particular uh, incentive to change their mind. Uh, if those discussions succeed, then it'll go through. If they don't, then it's um, I, I don't see how we would be able to move forward. But uh, I don't think the government of India has changed its mind at all. And it has been repeatedly said at virtually every political level that, in our view, it's a good deal. It achieves what we want. And we just hope that our political allies uh, can be made to understand that. Right up here. Mr. Eluwalia, good to have you here. Uh, I'm Nupur Gupta from uh, a mid-career at the Kennedy School. And uh, I wanted to ask you, we've been hearing about the special economic zones for uh, about a decade now, and we still don't have a running SEZ in India. 
I want to ask you, how important do you really think the SEZs would be for the growth tra trajectory that we are envisaging for India? Well, when you say we've been hearing about them for decades, uh, there needs to be slightly, we keep using different formulations. You've been hearing about export processing zones. Uh, they were a form of tax shelter, but there was not very much in, in that formula which ensured that infrastructure would be developed. The whole point of the special economic zones was that they would try to take a leaf, if you like, out of the Chinese book and not simply uh, define a tax shelter and say, if you set up something here, we won't tax you, but rather that if you as a developer want to develop a export a special economic zone, it doesn't have to be exports. The special economic zone is a zone, you could use it to service the domestic market, in which case you would pay the same tax on imports if you use it to service export markets, then you know, your imported uh, inputs would be duty free. So that's, that's a very important difference. But the key thing is that they would develop in situ infrastructure of a high quality that would enable producers to come in and hopefully establish themselves and be more productive, more efficient. Now, that did run into some, you know, everything in India, there's one advantage of being a, f open and a, a society prone to discussion. Everything runs into, uh, I would like to say everything leads to discussion. You could also say everything runs into controversy for a while. The key, the key issue there was that they, we used to have a practice earlier that if you set up a project, a private sector project, then the government would acquire the land ostensibly because this is a public purpose. Now this makes a lot of sense when you're building a bridge or you're building a road, but it does not make sense to acquire uh, under the right of eminent domain to intervene by law and acquire land, especially since the price you paid for it was not remotely connected with the market price. If you're just gonna hand it over to some big shot industrialist to build a zone. So the conclusion that was reached was that the government will not acquire land you have to go and buy your own land. If you need little parcels of it, you know, some percentage, then the government would be willing to acquire that land, but it would be priced what you paid when you acquired your land. So it introduced a whole degree of fairness as far as the farmers were concerned. Once that was clarified, about 180 special economic zones have been given permission and some humongous amount of money is supposed to be invested in these. But this is a process that is one year old. So you, the, the present initiative is a one year old initiative. And my guess is that if you want to evaluate it, it would be very interesting to know, is this different from the old export processing zone? I haven't the slightest doubt it'll be hugely different. But you know, for that we have to see, these zones have to be built, the investors have to come. I mean, it's a matter of two or three years. But there's too much, I mean, I just want to clarify that it's not the case that nothing has happened. I mean, 180 uh, of these zones has been actually approved, uh, which implies that they were able to sort out all these problems in a consensual manner. Just gonna have time for two more questions. First one there. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Anjali Ravi Kumar. I'm a first year uh, master's in public administration student. My area of interest is water resource management, so I was uh, uh, very pleased to hear you bring it up. Uh, my question also have to do with the uh, nature and objective of growth as it relates to India's water resources. And I want to know uh, from you as to what if there is any, uh, and what is the quality of, the debate on the kind of uh, technologies required for India to cope with an era of high energy prices and low water availability. And what my sec the second part is, what is the kind of role you see for the Planning Commission in promoting innovation uh, in this area? Because I feel that uh, we cannot have the kind of growth or we cannot develop as Western societies have developed for uh, some very obvious reasons. Well, that's a, lot, that's a lot of good questions. But let me just say that, you know, I mean, technology is always very important, but I don't think the key, I don't think the key issue here is either technology or the innovative role of the Planning Commission. 
The key problem with water is that property rights are not clearly defined. Now, unless you can define property rights properly, it's going to be very difficult to exploit this resource in an efficient manner. I mean, for example, as far as water is concerned, um, rivers flow through different states. Uh, states have very little incentive uh, to agree to water sharing arrangements. There's always, and, and one reason for that is that if you have a culture in which uh, the public sector is going to build the irrigation system and the water is going to be delivered more or less free, the demand for water upstream is going to be almost infinite. I mean, everybody wants to grow the most water intensive crop. Uh, so I think unless we can address this issue, uh, and introduce some better way of making sure that the, uh, the, either the water is appropriately priced or the water is appropriately shared. Uh, we're gonna have a problem as far as dams are concerned. Groundwater presents a special class of problem because under the Indian laws, I think it's the 1982, 1882 easement act, you have an absolute right to pump out from under any land you own, whatever water you can pump out of it, no matter what it does to the aquifer and whether it lowers other people's water. So now, this is again an issue that, you know, this is a common property resource uh, which we're not able to either ration or price. So frankly, uh, our, my feeling is that we need to address these issues. The technology is there. I mean, for example, Indian water use efficiency is horrible, about 40%. But you know, if water is free, why should anyone increase efficiency? Uh, so I think what, once we decide to ration the water in a sensible way, technology will do most of the rest. Uh, in Maharashtra, they have done something which is actually very innovative. They have, first of all, they've introduced a water regulatory authority. That regulatory authority determines whenever they're for every irrigation command, uh, what's the amount of water that should be released for each sort of whatever 200 or 500 hectares of land. And, and the distribution in that area would be done by the Water Users Association. And they volumetrically control uh, to make sure that each, each bunch of fields gets exactly the water that is deemed to be fair. So it's not the case that if you're at the upper end of the canal, you get all the water and it just never reaches the lower end. So they're using a quantitative method of sharing water. The moment that quantitative method is put in place, people are investing in drip irrigation and all the rest of it in order to make maximum use of water. You could do it through pricing, but it would be much, much more difficult because the, to achieve efficiency, uh, the water would have to be priced at levels that nobody at the moment is even willing to contemplate. Uh, so that, I, I think those are the big issues there. Where the Planning Commission is helping, I hope, is in trying to encourage state governments to follow the lead of the Maharashtra government. And it's, a, it's the only state that has done it, and one or two other states are hoping to follow suit. But I think if they were to do that, it would make a huge difference, at least to how water in irrigation systems is used more efficiently. Okay? This will be the last question. <clears throat> My name is Chetan Chaudhary, and I'm from the region of Vidarbha which has seen thousands of uh, suicides by farmers of small farms. And uh, recently, government uh, declared huge subsidies to small farmers to take care, mitigate this problem. Now, my, <clears throat> my question is, instead of government spending money on sub these kinds of subsidies to save the small farmers, which, I mean, they are so inefficient, and uh, they contribute to the inefficiencies in agriculture. And as you pointed out, uh, there has to be a migration from agriculture to non-agriculture, specifically to manufacturing. Uh, so my question is, is, are there any policy discussions going on to actually enable this migration, specifically of the small farmers, so that the small farms become available to bigger farmers who can acquire them, and create more efficient agriculture, and as well, the labor force becomes available to manufacturing, and the government doesn't have to spend that much on subsidies. Mm -hmm. So 
the, is the government encouraging non-government organizations to kind of retrain the uh, train the farmers so that they can move on to industry? Well, certainly, no. Training is a very important uh, element, and I, when I mentioned education, I when I use the word education, I had in mind also skill development, uh, particularly for small farmers. Uh, who are the ones that, uh, for whom we should most easily think of absorption in agriculture, it's very limited kind of skills for relatively simple manufacturing jobs that they can do. You know, we are obviously not pushing farmers out, but the normal economic processes uh, will create that. Uh, my view is that one of the reasons it hasn't happened in India is because we have labor laws that are too rigid. And that was the question which the young lady asked earlier. And she was appalled at the suggestion that we want to make labor laws more flexible. But the honest truth is if, they, if our labor laws were more flexible, uh, then I think that with the growth momentum that has already occurred and the buildup of infrastructure, more and more people would go in into creation or in, uh, and, and, and create more labor intensive, set up more labor intensive industries which would provide the employment, which would automatically draw these people out. So uh, I think in order to do that, two things are necessary. One is infrastructure, because really industrial competitiveness, particularly in backward regions like Vidarbha and so on, depends on building the right infrastructure. And the second, I think, is an improvement in the labor laws. Those are two factors. And plus, of course, the ability to provide skills to this labor force that would enable it to go into manufacturing. That is, in a way, in my view, the least problematic because uh, there are systems for doing that, they're being expanded, and they can be put in place within a year. These other things take a little longer. Okay? Thank you very much. So my thanks to Mr. Alawalia for his terrifically and thoughtful remarks and to all of you for your questions. Please have a safe evening. Good night.